Caleb and I would like to thank everybody for coming tonight for our inaugural, um, it's a mouthful if I can say it, Vineyard to Farm Table Tasting Dinner. Um, this is the first time we've done a dinner uh, with the, our farm partners actually here, which is very, very exciting. We were both studying dance in college, and it was the dancing that eventually took us to Italy. A friend of ours, another dancer, was Italian. Right, who we'd still met in is, college. Still, still dancing. Still, and still Italian. Um, <laughs> But that's how we ended up in Italy as dancers. And then after being in Italy for totally different, for, for one purpose, we got blindsided by the culture and the food. And when we moved back, we realized that we didn't necessarily want to give that up. In fact, we wanted to create a vehicle for a, a lifestyle that we had learned about, just started to learn about while living there. And so we started to think about how we could structure our work life in such a way that we could pay respect to what we had been shown and taught in Italy. I like to make carbonara the way we were served it at this little cafe in Milan, not far from the library there where we were doing some research one spring. Beautiful building. Um, Lots of dusty tomes on the shelves that you can't touch. Right, they have, the <laughs> staff has to do everything for you. They have to. You, you can look you up in the card book, catalog. Right, and, you can't pick a book off the, the shelves. Right, you can't go hunting among the volumes yourself. They have to go collect things for you. We left our books right there on the table where we were working in the confidence that they would be there, I should say, with the reassurances that they would be there when we got back. And went out looking for lunch and walked down the street and around a couple of corners and found this little cafe. We saw people sitting at the next table. And they were having spaghetti alla carbonara and we knew right away that's what we had to have. So that's what we ordered. And we were right. It was delicious. And that place only used the yolks in the dish and that was a practice we immediately adopted and it right some recipes will call for uh, the, the whole, whole egg, egg. Um, some recipes sacrilegiously call, call for, for cream. cream not done I do want to thank um, our special guests and uh, I had an opportunity to make my first in-person visit to Kyle and Jen's farm uh, this past week and uh, it's a it's a beautiful site it's a beautiful farm and uh, they have beautiful animals too and uh, so I'm very excited about the food that we've had a chance to work with for this evening so I'm looking forward to that. Jen will be at one table, Kyle will be at the other table and they will talk to you a little bit about the farm um, just give you some basic information and history and throughout the evening they are happy to answer any questions you might have about the farm, about um, the kinds of work they're doing, uh, how they're growing and developing for the future. The kind of cooking that we do, which is actually called Cucina Casareccia um, or uh, housewife cooking, uh, country style cooking, home style, home style cooking. cooking. Um, we felt that that was, in terms of restaurant culture, those recipes being taken uh, back to the United States, a lot of those recipes were being lost. And, and even in Italy, you could see some of those things being lost. So we, we felt that preservation was very key in uh, what we would offer on our menu, and that we wanted to learn old heirloom recipes from somebody's grandmother, uh, in the home kitchen, uh, as well as tiny little family-run restaurants uh, that were still run by people who had a connection to the reasons that those recipes were developed. Um, as, as an example, uh, it's very traditional in Sicily to use breadcrumbs in pasta dishes because they didn't have enough money to have cheese in order to provide texture for the dish. So they would use stale breadcrumbs which is something that they had on hand to right. provide this great texture. And of course, you serve that now, um, and it becomes a very innovative um, thing for the American palate because right. it's like, wow, breadcrumbs, who would have thought of but that? But it's an ancient idea. But it's an ancient idea. It comes out of the home. It comes out of poverty. And one of our philosophies is that the most elegant food is the, is the cuisine of the poor. And when you understand where those practices come from and you institute them in your own kitchen, you have come to understand that they are a brilliant solution 
because things like using breadcrumbs and pasta is a way to take these other ingredients that they have, like a few salted anchovies, and I mean a few salted anchovies, and good olive oil, and some garlic and parsley, and the breadcrumbs become a way to spread those flavors, having absorbed those flavors into the breadcrumbs, spread those flavors around a whole dish of pasta so that those uh, strong flavors become palatable and, and work together in, in harmony to create a good dish. This really is a mission that we brought back from Italy, and, and the mission, first and foremost, was about preservation of recipes that we had collected while we were there studying food, but we also return every year so that we can collect more heirloom recipes to bring back to serve at the restaurant. And experience how cooks in Italy today, both professional and home cooks, are, are doing what we're doing, and how they... Um, how they study their own cuisine and, and in Italy it's so important to them and it really is on a societal level right. a kind of field of study for people well, wh what they eat and why they eat it that way. And, and we have to remember that the slow food movement started in Italy and when we started what we're doing with the bakery that then became the restaurant, we started with those same slow food principles that we had learned over there uh, to, sort of innately. We didn't even understand them at that stage as being quote unquote slow food. Certainly nothing it was formally just the, stated. No, it was just the way people went about their daily business. You went and you provisioned every day for your meal for lunch and your meal for dinner. You bought fresh ingredients, you bought local ingredients, and by the time we came back here to open our own place, those things seemed very obvious to us. Right. And certainly being in Vermont was a, a great location for trying to duplicate that kind of, uh, not only lifestyle, but that, restaurant culture, yeah. because we did have access to, and, and still do, obviously, um, to great local um, ingredients and primary Prime materials. Uh, prime materials. Uh, from everything from greens to local pork, beef, cheese. Uh, cheese. The cheese uh, world in Vermont is, is amazing. This is the cacio that uh, is made by our friend, uh, our friends Jody and Louisa um, from Dancing You Farm. It's uh, called Prima Cacciotta, which is a traditional Tuscan style cheese. It's made with organic cow's milk. It's a little vague where carbonara possibly came from. Probably comes from a lot of places. Probably comes from a lot of places. One thought is that um, there was a group called, in the early 1800s, called the Carbonari, and they were a revolutionary group that was trying to free Italy from foreign rule, um, from Napoleon and his crew. And story goes that they developed this dish in their little secret private meetings. Another is that it came out of Lazio, outside of Rome, that the um, from the Sabine Mountains, that the Sabine women uh, made this dish. Another is that it comes from World War II, from the Americans, actually, who brought eggs and bacon over. We started out with this concept of preservation, and, and as we have developed our own skills and our philosophy, what came out of preservation was also this sense of revitalization. You, you can't just have preservation. Uh, because if you only preserve what is historical, uh, there's something, um, de it can be deadening to do that. And we very quickly realized that this wasn't about uh, creating a mausoleum uh, or a museum that was something that people could just sort of look at or would be, be put away um, in terms of the collection of these recipes or if we wanted to write about them right. and collect them in the book or, or something like that, that they had to be a living, working archive of recipes and dishes that we were right. making with local, living, right. working, organic uh, and they would have ingredients, a, that they would have a relevance. And a usefulness to and the usefulness. diner that, that the diner can, um, the diner finds food that is approachable, that is understandable and relevant to them and is not presented in a way that sets it apart or outside of their day-to-day -day existence, but in fact is food that they can 
understand within the course of their daily life. They don't have to see it as a special entertainment event. I'm thinking we're going to have an Alianico. Now, Alianico is a, a varietal that um, is considered the noble grape of southern Italy and it has been around for a very long time. They think it came to Italy from uh, Greece. And one of the ways that we got into this notion of revitalization has to do with our work with wine, um, and specifically my work with the wine list. Not only do we have an all-Italian wine list to reflect what Caleb is doing with the food, but my focus has been to bring back and to support what are considered rare varietals. There are about 2,000 varietals grown in Italy or, or available in Italy alone. There are probably about 300 that are being produced at this stage and more and more all the time as university programs begin to, to work with these old, almost extinct varietals. And that has become a real mission of mine to offer those wines on my wine list that will pair with the food in the, the, from the regions that those grapes are grown. And that, I think, was one of the, the avenues that we followed or paths that we followed to get to this idea of revitalist in terms of our menu and our kitchen. My wife and I actually run a small dairy farm in Tunbridge, Vermont. Um, my wife is the fourth generation on the farm. My son will be the fifth generation on the farm. And the farm has been within the family for over 100 years as an actively working dairy farm. Um, currently we milk about 40 um, Holstein jerseys, a couple Guernseys, a Brown Swiss. Um, we're an equal opportunity employer. <laughs> and uh, we ship our milk um, con to uh, the organic cow. So we are a certified organic milk producer. And we also have been selling our veal. And we have some beef and we have chickens. We're selling eggs and we're hoping to do a, a garden this summer. I'm going to bury these yolks and cheese. The yolks will cook when we throw in the hot pasta and hot bacon on top, and they'll cook as much as we need them to. My interest in wine has led me to also not only want to be able to pair wines with Caleb's food, uh, and to educate people about these wines that they may have never heard of um, or tasted, but to also actually uh, grow grapes and make wine. I felt like it wasn't just enough to develop this, as we were talking about, organic archive, this living organic archive of wines. I wanted to be able to tend to the vines. I wanted to be able to learn how to make wine. And so that is something that we have embarked on. Right. Uh, planting a vineyard here in Vermont, which I'm sure some people will think is kind of crazy, but that's all changing with uh, the types of varietals that are uh, available for cold climate. Faro, is, as many know, is an ancient grain and it uh, makes a great pasta, especially for people who don't do well with wheat. There's so many ingredients that are particular to Italian recipes, and while many of those things are grown in the States, they're very difficult for us to come by here through the available channels, and so the solution is obviously to grow your own, and we've undertaken to do that. Being able to grow vegetables that are perhaps a little more unusual and particular to certain areas of Italy really means that we have an opportunity to offer an experience for a diner that gives them the chance to really eat and experience the same things that people in Italy are eating. When you talk about wine, we talk about terroir or the the, how the earth affects the grapes and affects the wine and the outcome. And that is really a, a sentiment that we have taken on in terms of what we grow for the restaurant in right. terms of ingredients. Right. And now really think of not only is our wine list terroir driven, but our kitchen is terroir driven. Right. And I think that that is, when, when you talk about local, when you talk about sustainability, it's, it's about the earth. It's about the earth that these things are grown in and that um, we, we had somebody uh, once tell us recently, a, a guest here in the restaurant, that they felt like they could really taste the earth in what they were eating. Everything was mm -hmm. earthier here than maybe they had experienced someplace else. And I took that as one of the greatest compliments that we could 
get that they felt like they were they were had a closer connection to where their food and wine was coming from. Most of our management style is based on the grass-based system that we have in the valley, um, and we're really trying to develop the highest quality food that we can create for our customers. The Guernsey, they're actually known for their golden color in their milk, and they actually have higher butter fat, as do the brown Swiss and Jerseys. The Holsteins actually are known for producing a lot of milk, um, but not as high quality butter fat. But the Jerseys and the, the Guernseys and everybody else are better for cheese making and, and that type of thing. Not yet. That's our plan. We actually, we've been planning this last year. We actually put together what we call a dairy management team, sort of our own little board, if you will, and of people who just help us come up with ideas and say, you know, that's a good idea or not so good idea. And um, we're hopefully going to be doing some cheese or yogurt in the future. My old boss used to jump up and down in frustration. If a dish was not salted adequately before it hit the table, she never had salt on the table in her restaurants. And we took that lesson from her. Make sure that food is properly seasoned. So the Alianico that we're going to have is from a, a wine producer in the Cilento, which is a part of Campania. Um, it's right around Paestum. And uh, Bruno Di Conchilis, it's, uh, it's an all-organic uh, vineyard. And he does all the traditional grape varietals of uh, southern Campania, Alianico, Greco di Tufo, Fiano. Um, I think those are the three that he focuses on. A lot of the things that we are interested in growing in our own garden for the restaurant are the different kinds of greens that you find throughout Italy in the different markets in the different regions. Chicory, different kinds of radicchio for our own salads or for sautéing or braising to right. serve with meats or to use in the pasta or rice dishes gives us this vehicle and of course introduces a whole new dynamic into the work of the restaurant because we have these things growing in the garden and now we have to respond to the garden in the kitchen in terms of right. taking advantage of something that's ready now or looking right. ahead and saying okay those beans are going to start to be ready next week I need to plan and do a little recipe research and figure out how I want to employ them together with the other things that we have going on in the kitchen and it's an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous white. Very clean, very crisp. This was actually the the wine that inspired the idea of tea um, as an ingredient or an element um, because I, I had gotten a lot of smoke. When I first uh, tasted it and smelled it and got, and got Lapsang Souchong <laughs> at the finish at the back of the mouth, so I don't know if any, when you're tasting it, if you get any of that. Here, smell that. That's great. It smells like lunch. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm also thinking of the Sicilian melons. You know, they, they're supposed to be really big <laughs> and they need a lot a lot of heat which uh, this water. summer we didn't have a lot of heat and our melons were maybe about that big they were right. still very good they were but very they, good but you know so you, okay maybe they need to get started um, in a greenhouse before the growing season here really begins right so we built a greenhouse with some help from our friends, one of those plastic covered hoop houses. Of course, the first thing we learned after getting it done was that we need to make it bigger. One of the things that we've also become really interested in has been to do winter harvest because that's still something that's just starting to catch on here in the Northeast to be able to grow um, in these high tunnel houses or hoop houses um, or more traditional greenhouses. Um, there aren't a lot of people producing all year long, so right. in order it's to... It's a challenge. Yeah, that, I mean, obviously this climate is a challenge, so to, in order to be able to continue using uh, local ingredients, we have felt like we want to, okay, so we'll start growing in the winter so we can keep having our own greens for salad and root vegetables and right. whatever else that we can um, coax into growing during right. these cold months. So that's going to be... 
if that's going to be a steep learning curve over the next few years. Dessert wines uh, are, take a lot, of, uh, a lot of care, and they take a lot of uh, work uh, and, and a lot of expense to make. And that's why you typically find dessert wines is a little bit more pricier than, than, than normal. Uh, because basically what he's doing here is he's, he's letting half of, his, half of his wine evaporate to make this real concentrated, beautifully textured, beautifully colored uh, wine. And to me, I get a little bit of a, 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 of a caramel, but again, touching on this, on this, on this uh, yeah, this, this common thread of tea in, in the wines uh, tonight, you know? Um, this is the first DOCG, the, uh, the Rosciotto from Suave. It's a, considered one of the great dessert wines of Italy, uh, along, with, uh, along there next to Vinsanto of, of Tuscany. But the Rosciotto di, di Suave is, a, there is an exceptional uh, wine from, uh, from northern, northern Italy. And quite honestly, I think the pairing with this is going to be absolutely wondrous. It goes great with, uh, with torts, pear torts, apple torts, these kind of things that have sort of a caramelized essence to them. Um, and I hope you enjoy it for, for, uh, with the, what we have tonight, which is the uh, yogurt and apple, apple dessert. So, thank you so much for uh, joining us in this, in this tour, of, tour of Italy. And I enjoy you. I hope you Am I pouring off the fat? I am not. When we first opened the bakery, I was in the middle of graduate school getting an MFA in creative writing. And I always thought or hoped that I might write the great American novel, and maybe that will still happen. But through a conversation with a good friend who was an editor, he said, have you ever thought about writing a book about the restaurant or what you guys are doing here at the restaurant? And that was really what got me thinking about trying to do a book together. So what I wanted to do was create a collection of essays about our experiences in Italy and our experiences here in Vermont in the early years of the restaurant. And it seemed natural that Caleb would collect the recipes um, or, or compile the recipes that we had so far collected uh, to put in relationship to those essays. And we had, we've been talking a lot about local and seasonality and sustainability. So one of the ideas for the, that book was to create a, a, a cookbook and, and an essay collection that was driven by the seasons, so spring, summer, winter, right. uh, fall, and winter. And that the, the recipes would um, adhere to or recognize what kinds of ingredients were available during those seasons. And the pieces that I would write, the essays, would be about experiences we'd had in Italy or here during those times of year. And I also wanted to write recipes with a particular attitude in mind in order to say something to people who cook at home that allows them or, or encourages them to think about their meals and their food and their life in a way that hopefully helps integrate their thinking of their food with the whole rest of their daily life. Because modern American schedules between work or study, the demands of those schedules are so intense and right. consuming and right. so much part of our identities that really mealtime is something well, it's becoming a lost art it's, yeah and it's also not necessarily something that is that is really integrated with the rest of what we do in our life which is not historically the case in Italy people over there think all the time about what they want to eat, what, what they're going to eat, what's available now. <laughs> right. uh, when they run into their friends on the street, they don't say, hey, how's work? The first thing they say is, do you want to, let's go get something. In late winter, we've got the seasons and the essays that relate to the recipes, and it's our time in Italy and here in the restaurant in Vermont. I wanted to mirror that a little bit with Libation, the book about wine and spirits, in that it would be the things that inspired me abroad. I hope everybody's hungry. There's a piece on vodka uh, and our experience traveling in Minsk and Belarus. There's a piece on Irish whiskey and um, some... Uh, about our first time being in Ireland. 
in addition, there's a lot of stuff, obviously, about Italy and Italian wine. Um, but also about the, it, those pieces would be intercut by my experience here in Vermont trying to plant a vineyard, uh, my first attempts at making wine, my first mistakes with making wine, uh, my first attempts at making things like the Rosolio. I think it's important to represent the dishes that have come to be recognized as classics. As we experience dishes that are classics, we come to understand that millions of people before us have eaten that thing. When we then have that same experience, it gives us an important perspective on where we are in the continuum of humanity. I can share in an experience that is so common and so elemental mm -hmm. and that ties me in some minute, perhaps ethereal, perhaps concrete way that really informs my life. It is one of the only true ways to experience history. We're time traveling in a sense and right. that is also key, I think, to what we're trying to do here at the restaurant, what we're trying to write about when we write about what we're doing here at the restaurant, right. is those experiences of what we're sharing together right now in the present, what has gone before us in history, and, and also all the memory that happens in between. Uh, it, it's really not only, you know, we go back to preservation, revitalization, and terroir, but that's all really based on, on memory, and it's a philosophy of memory. Right, right. And the way to realize that in a, in a daily, practical way is to then do what the cooks then did. So if I can get fresh pork belly um, from a local farmer and cure it into pancetta and use that in my dish and get cacio made by the cheesemaker um, over, you know, near Rutland... Right. And and use that as the cheese in the dish, and then the eggs come from the farm up the road. As a, as a cook, I'm doing exactly what the cooks 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 or 400 years ago did where they were. They worked with what they had. They found the best thing they could. Um, they did what they knew how to do with it, which in most cases was as little as possible and the most direct thing to prepare it, to make it suitable for eating. And, and, and that's what they ate. And I think today, when so much is designed to be made for our convenience, we need to remember how important it is to maintain that absolutely direct, pure connection. And uh, it it's, 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 has always been important and will only be more important as we go along. Let's have carbonara for lunch. Ooh, we could have carbonara for lunch. Hey, well, cheers. Cheers. Here's to a good lunch. Yeah, here's to a good lunch. A proper lunch. There's enough for everybody, so yeah. why don't you come sit down?